We are very fortunate in Shoalhaven. We have extensive natural environments, with a rich diversity of species both plant and animal. With so much on our doorstep, one might ask is there a problem? Is our natural heritage at risk? Is it vanishing? Sadly it is vanishing, and at an alarming rate. In this video, you may become acquainted, with the seldom seen fellow residents of our environments, many of them in danger of disappearing forever, due to our poor stewardship of the earth. Australia is facing an extinction crisis. Australia has the worst mammal extinction rate in the world, 30 native mammals have become extinct since European settlement. To put this in a global context, one out of three mammal extinctions in the last 400 years have occurred in Australia. Around 5,000 square kilometres of virgin bushland and advanced regrowth are cleared annually. In addition to destroying native wildlife, it is the major cause of salinity and causes around 14% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. Australia has lost 25% rainforest, 45% of open forest, 32% woodland forest and 30% of mallee forest in 200 years. The effect of these changes has been considerable. Around 20% of Australian mammals, 7% of reptiles, 13% of birds are listed as extinct, endangered or vulnerable. More than 100 species have gone extinct in NSW in the last 200 years. Government figures reveal that almost 60% of all the land clearing that occurred in New South Wales over the three-year period before 2013 was unexplained. The NSW report on native vegetation 2013 to 2014, released by the Office of Environment and Heritage, shows 13,500 hectares of woody vegetation cleared for crops, pastures or thinning, over the three years to 2013 was probably illegal, and yet there have been strident calls for controls on clearing vegetation to be eased significantly, and the government appears to be listening. Between 2010 and 2018 a total of 6.63 million hectares of land was cleared. The figures also showed unexplained clearing occurred on more than 4,400 properties, yet government agencies launched and completed only 818 compliance and enforcement actions in the same period. Too often an uncaring attitude towards the future seems to prevail. It brings to mind a discussion I had with a landowner at Sturt's Meadows north of Broken Hill years ago, who was complaining about his land becoming degraded and infested with pig weed. He was clearly overstocking with sheep. His response was, well it will last me out. In 2014 to 2015, the woody vegetation clearing rate in Queensland was 296,000 hectares per year. Between 2010 and 2018 80% of koala habitat was cleared for beef production. A total of 2.4 million hectares was cleared in that period. In New South Wales, the government is planning to follow Queensland's lead by ripping up their native vegetation laws. In Victoria the total was 177,000 hectares. In South Australia 108,000 and in Western Australia 288,000 hectares. Illegal and legal land clearing in this country are only one issue. We hear about clearing of native vegetation all the time. We also hear about logging of old growth trees all the time, but some of our unthinking actions are creating havoc in other ways. We still drain swamps to increase grazing land, often in low nitrogen locations, prompting broadcast of fertilizers, without a scientific analysis of how much is enough. The excess will often end up in the waterways. We still convert small holdings into vast monocultures, to maximize economies of scale. This necessitates the use of pesticides to compensate for loss of natural pest predators, and also compounding that loss through poisoning 
Unrestricted access by vehicles is often the first step, and everyone demands the right to drive anywhere they feel like. Access is developed by management, primarily for fire control or pest species management, but trails also provide a vector for pest dispersal. Access also makes it easy for the thieves. Access leads to outcrops like this, which are often wildlife refuges for small mammals, reptiles, amphibians and the invertebrates they feed on. And sometimes it leads to this. Around Sydney in the 1960s, bush rock thieves carried out regular raids in all the sandstone national parks around Sydney, Royal, Kooringai, Muogamara, Brisbane Waters, Maramara and Blue Mountains. Their impact was devastating. People exploit natural environments for resources, as if they have a God-given right. Imposing legal sanctions against the perpetrators is extremely costly, difficult, and too often token when successful. Next time you see a pallet of bushrock for sale at the nursery, consider whose homes have been destroyed, and the biodiversity that is at risk. There are more than enough manufactured products for landscaping needs, at very competitive costs. We will look at some of the animals affected. Geckos often find their insect food under slabs and in rock cavities. This one the wood gecko is very occasionally found under rock slabs but has a much wider distribution than you might expect. The narrow coastal strip from just north of Brisbane around the south to Kalbarai in Western Australia is its range. It is only about 75 mm long. The thick-tailed gecko is less common, though it does occur right across the southern half of Australia. They are about 125 mm long. They are also called the barking gecko. They have soft velvety skin and are able to shed their tail, which continues to wriggle and distract a predator. The leaf-tailed gecko is very common in the Sydney Basin and the Hawkesbury Sandstone, including in the Shoalhaven, but occurs nowhere else. The skin is dry and rough. Again the tail can be sacrificed to a predator. Lisa's gecko is one of the commonest in the Hawkesbury Sandstone country, but has a very limited distribution, and doesn't occur outside the Sydney Basin and the Queensland border ranges. It is also called the Velvet Gecko. So two out of the four geckos that occur in the sandstone country in the Shoalhaven are extremely vulnerable to habitat loss. People still release foreign animals and birds into the natural environments. Too often there are reports of problem species appearing where they were never known before and could only have been introduced by human intervention, foxes to Tasmania, cane toads to offshore islands, game animals like deer to national parks for illegal hunting. Recently unwanted alpaca were being turned loose to fend for themselves. Feral cats kill an estimated 75 million native animals every night across Australia. And not only are the animals we introduced to this country a problem. And safe here? Well actually no. Even our wilderness areas have become infested with feral cats and foxes, wild goats, wild sheep and two or more species of deer. They may not be seen often, but their impact can be disproportionate to their numbers, sometimes indirectly, from the interconnectedness of the life web. And this impact is coupled by people illegally helping themselves to resources. What may appear to be harmless collecting reduces important habitat. Rocky areas are critical for small mammals and reptiles. A case in point is this now rare broadhead snake. According to the experts, its bite is not expected to be lethal, which is at odds with belief of 60 years ago. Broadheads are entirely restricted to the Sydney sandstone country, and that includes most of the Shoalhaven. They live mainly under rock slabs, on top of rock platforms. They are known to climb though, and may shelter under large bark slabs on trees. Broadheads are extremely vulnerable to the depredations of bush rock thieves. Seldom seen are small-eyed snakes. They often shelter under slabs. To the untrained eye, they may be confused with a common black snake. 
distribution of this snake is along the coast from Cape York to southern Victoria, so it is not regarded as endangered, but it is locally uncommon and threatened by habitat loss. It is rarely inclined to bite, but one fatality has been recorded. It tends to be active mainly at night. It only grows to about 300 mm. Another rarely seen is the golden crown snake, which is also mainly nocturnal. It is harmless and only grows to about 75 cm. It takes take up a threatening pose if disturbed, but rarely attempts to bite. The last one I saw was brought into the National Parks Office in Nara a few years ago, and it was like seeing an old friend. I hadn't seen one for about 50 years. Unsurprisingly, no one at the office had seen one before. This one I caught when I was a youth. The golden crowned snake feeds at night. It searches for sleeping lizards by scent, taking them from their nighttime retreats. It may also eat frogs and blind snakes. It is found only in a narrow coastal strip from Toastville to Canberra. No, it's not a snake but a legless lizard. I thought maybe you'd had enough of snakes. And this lizard whilst seldom seen, is not endangered, but relatively common across the southern third of Australia. We also have another legless lizard, Burton's, which has a long arrow-shaped head. It occurs almost all over Australia except Tasmania. Both legless lizards are relatively small, perhaps up to 60 centimeters, and of course harmless. Note where the body crosses on the left side is a small flap, which is in fact a vestigial hind leg. Burton's doesn't have any vestigial legs. We might now turn our attention to a related habitat, escarpments and caves. Hawkesbury, or Triassic sandstone, has some weathering characteristics, which are of great significance to creation of habitat. It forms shallow caves and overhangs. These structures are very important habitat for a whole range of species, including mammals, birds, reptiles, and arthropods. A large proportion of the Shoalhaven region is located on Hawkesbury sandstone. Sandstone is composed of very pure silica grains and a small amount of the iron mineral siderite in varying proportions, bound with a clay matrix. It oxidizes to the warm yellow brown color that is notable in the buildings which are constructed of it. Wherever there are cliffs, steep gorges and escarpments, there are likely to be caves, some just shallow overhangs, but some large enough to fit a house inside. They were particularly useful to the Aboriginal people, both here and elsewhere. Even burials rarely took place there, though they are much more noted for ash and shell deposits, which were sometimes quite deep. On stable walls and ceiling, there may be drawings in ochre and charcoal. Siderite is a mineral composed primarily of iron carbonate. It belongs to the calcite group of minerals and is easily altered to iron oxides, iron carbonate, usually containing some magnesium and calcium. Siderite tends to migrate and form iron-rich bands, leaving the matrix impoverished, in other words, without sufficient glue to hold the silica grains together. Sometimes this leads to honeycombing, but also to unusual formations. As a bushwalker, I could rarely resist the temptation to explore the caves and overhangs, not just because they were visually interesting, but so often they rewarded me with the glimpses of the creatures that inhabited the caves. Rock warblers hang their nests from the roof, bogum moths and crane flies shelter there. Marsupial mice build nests in the honeycomb crannies. Brown tree snakes take up residence and prey on the marsupial mice. I have seen owls roosting there, and on one occasion, even found a lyrebird nest with young one inside, on a rock ledge inside a large cave. I had to make a climbing pole to reach the nest, and as soon as the pole touched the side of the nest, the young one inside set up a screeching alarm. Sandstone caves can be fascinating places, though they often require a strenuous climb to reach them. And of course, often as not they are empty, and the effort is in vain. Antechinus nests are usually just a heap of dry gum leaves, but they can be quite bulky. I think my favorite quarry in sandstone caves 
Was this insect eating marsupial mouse? Incredibly agile, they can run virtually upside down, across the roof of a sandstone overhang. This bowl in Kuringai Chase National Park is about 600 mm across. Normally the iron forms bands, most often following natural bedding planes. I have seen lots of contorted strata and ring formations, but I suspect this bowl would be quite unique. In the 1960s, we lived in a house overlooking Broken Bay, miles from the nearest house. Finding droppings around the fireplace, I set a box trap, and sure enough that night caught Antechinus on a peanut butter and oats bait. After branding him with an indelible mark, I released him the following night, about 200 meters down a nearby gully. A few hours later at 4 a.m., I heard the trap close, and yes you guessed it, our visitor was the mouse back again. Perhaps he liked the warmth of the fire, and the wood smoke drew him back. This is a typical Elliot trap, of the type used by ecologists surveying for fauna. Before the Park Service was formed, in the early 1950s, I was granted a scientific license by the then Chief Guardian of Fauna, to trap small animals, but my traps were homemade box structures, bulky, and a pain to transport around in the field. Elliot traps weren't yet available. They were designed in Victoria by an amateur naturalist in 1965. The return of our house guest so soon, was quite a surprise. He'd had to negotiate some pretty rough bushland. Perhaps he liked peanut butter, but the next night I had to take him much further away. Not that I really minded him as a tenant, but I suspect mouse dirt of any kind in the house is unwelcome by any wife. Marsupial mice don't only live in caves of course, but also in tree hollows, and under well-attached slabs of bark, or any similar hole or crevice in the rocks. Now Antechinus is not rare or endangered, but few people see them, thanks to domestic cats. And half the population dies at the end of the breeding season. Sex for the males is a fatal pastime. One good reason to look on them favorably though, is that they are known to kill and eat house mice, and won't raid your pantry, or contaminate your food. Their main diet is moths, caterpillars and grasshoppers. They may even eat cockroaches, and they are very welcome to those, though how they'd tolerate the revolting taste is hard to imagine. Note the different teeth of the marsupial, to the rodent teeth of the house mouse. Note also the flattened cranium, which enables Antechinus access into narrow rock crevices. Marsupial teeth are clearly suited to eating insects or flesh. Rodent teeth are designed to gnaw on nuts, seeds and vegetative matter. A significant predator on marsupial mice is the brown tree snake. They are nocturnal and live often in sandstone caves, which is where I'd caught this one. As its name suggests, it also lives in trees. It will also live in urban areas. The species has also been called night tiger or doll's eye. Night tiger is a backfanged snake, not dangerous to humans, and grows to about one meter. It is native to eastern and northern coastal Australia, eastern Indonesia, Sulawesi to Papua New Guinea, and a large number of islands in northwestern Melanesia. This snake is infamous for being an invasive species, responsible for devastating the majority of the native bird population in Guam, where it is believed to have been accidentally introduced as a ship stowaway. This photo taken when they were common. I took this photo as a boy at Jenilan Caves. Now they are rare, like most of the rock wallabies. One of the rarest mammals in the Shoalhaven is the brush-tailed rock wallaby. In the last 70 years, rock wallaby numbers have gone through a catastrophic decline. Of some 16 species originally occurring throughout Australia, most are at risk, and virtually all live in very small isolated pockets. Many previously known populations have disappeared altogether. Some like the yellow-footed rock wallaby of South Australia, were once hunted for their beautiful fur. Today the major threat comes from foxes, but young animals are vulnerable to feral cats. 
As their name suggests, rock wallabies favor caves, overhangs, escarpments, and rocky areas. Competing for cave space are feral goats, which inhibit wallabies with their presence. Goats also compete directly for food, since both species are browsers. A survey of rock wallaby distribution in parts of southern New South Wales in 1995 identified the Kangaroo Valley area as an important stronghold for rock wallabies in southern NSW. It was recommended that a 1080 fox baiting program be instigated in order to reduce predation pressure on the rock wallabies and aid rock wallaby survival and population growth. This program was commenced in the Kangaroo Valley area in 1995. At this time, it was estimated that there were between 30 to 60 rock wallabies remaining in the Shoalhaven. In 2001, the NSW Fox Threat Abatement Plan was produced to address the impact of predation by the red fox on threatened species. This plan identified brush-tailed rock wallabies as one of a group of threatened species most likely to be impacted by fox predation and thus a high priority for the assistance of fox control. The plan also identified the Shoalhaven area as one of a dozen priority sites in NSW. The Shoalhaven Brush-Tailed Rock Wallaby Protection Program continues today as one of the funded sites with regular fox baiting and rock wallaby monitoring works. Fox baiting was also extended to the Ilaru area in April 2002. Some consideration was given to trying a surrogate system in NSW employing Tama wallabies, but it isn't part of any recovery plan in NSW. One of the real difficulties is that such a system is very labor-intensive. The platypus is one of Australia's only two amphibious mammals, the water rat is the other. Belonging to a very ancient family of mammals that lay eggs, it is now a threatened species, at risk from land clearing, dams, drought, bushfires and climate change, as well as potential predation by foxes, snakes, water rats, and birds of prey. Impacts from human activity are destroying critical platypus habitat, leaving them with nowhere to go. Over the last 30 years, suitable habitat has shrunk by at least 22%. It is no wonder the species is in decline. They feed in both slow-moving and rapid parts of streams, but show preference to coarser bottom substrates, particularly gravel. Diet of the platypus consists mainly of invertebrates, particularly insect larvae. The species also feeds on free-swimming organisms such as shrimps, water beetles, water bugs and tadpoles. To most people, a rat by any other name is still a rat. But bad press deservedly assigned to a few is not appropriate to all. Some, like the Australian water rat, are attractive engaging creatures, though extremely shy. The water rat is one of Australia's largest rodents, up to 1.3 kilograms, and is usually found near permanent bodies of fresh or brackish water. The rats live in burrows alongside river and lake banks. The water rat feeds on a wide range of prey, including large insects, crustaceans, mussels and fish, frogs, lizards, small mammals and water birds. It forages by swimming underwater. Once it catches its prey, it usually carries it back to a regular feeding site. Although these native rodents are usually nocturnal, the water rat is most active around sunset, and may even forage during the day. The burrow is usually hidden among vegetation, and built along the banks of rivers and lakes. The round entrance has a diameter of about 15 centimeters. In dense populations, males are territorial, and defend their areas aggressively. In these circumstances, it is common to see water rats with damaged tails as a result of these fights. During the depression in the 1930s, a ban was placed on the import of skins, mostly American muskrat. The water rat was seen as a perfect substitute, and the price of a water rat pelt increased from 4 shillings in 1931 to 10 shillings in 1941. The species was heavily hunted during this time, until protective legislation was introduced. Populations seem to have made a recovery. 
The main threats to the water ad today are habitat alteration as a result of flood mitigation, swamp drainage, and predation. Anecdotal evidence suggests that water ad numbers have declined in many places in southeastern Australia, particularly since the mid-1990s, probably due to the combined impacts of drought and habitat degradation. Another likely local is the swamp rat, indeed there were five recorded sightings in the Shoalhaven in 2010. The swamp rat is found near the coast of South and Eastern Australia. It occurs in lowland country from Fraser Island down the coast of New South Wales and Victoria to the Mount Lofty Ranges in South Australia. A subspecies can be found in Tasmania, and another subspecies lives in isolated patches of high-altitude rainforest near Atherton, Queensland. The preferred habitat of the swamp rat is thick vegetation along watercourses and in swamps. Dense vegetation of islands above the high water mark is also suitable. They can also live in areas of coastal heath, dune scrub, grasslands and sedge lands. During the summer months, the species will increase its intake of insects as well as fungi, however during spring months, the rats switch to eating an increased amount of seeds due to their abundance and possible nutritional value in breeding season. It is active during the day and at night. It is thought that the species does not collect the sufficient amount of food throughout the night and must also collect vegetation during the day. When surveying for fauna, we use a variety of traps, but we don't always know what to expect. This swamp rat in Maramara Creek didn't want to be surveyed and tried to escape. He looks uncomfortable, but he was quite unharmed. The sheet metal traps were generally better for comfort, but a trap shy animal that can't see outside might be reluctant to enter a closed space. More common than the swamp rat is the bush rat. The bush rat doesn't show much overlap in diet with other local rodent species. In the summer it consumes primarily fruit, arthropods, and seeds, but in the winter its main source of food is from a particular sedge species. When found in the forest, it consumes primarily fungi and various fibrous plant material. Bush rats have been observed feeding on nectar without damaging the blossoms, thus likely aiding in pollination. The bush rat is found primarily in the coastal regions of southeastern Australia. While it is mainly found in the lowlands, the bush rat can also be found in parts of the Australian Alps and on some offshore islands, including Kangaroo Island. The bush rat is terrestrial and prefers areas with dense undergrowth. It constructs a burrow that leads down into the nest chamber and is lined with grass and other vegetation. While it is mainly found in the lowlands, the bush rat can also be found in parts of the Australian Alps and on some offshore islands, including Kangaroo Island. The bush rat is terrestrial and prefers areas with dense undergrowth. It constructs a burrow that leads down into the nest chamber and is lined with grass and other vegetation. In the early 1960s, I was stationed at West Head, overlooking Broken Bay. We were remote from suburbia, the nearest house was 12 miles away. The road had only recently been bituminist, though a rough bush track had been in use since the Second World War. My assigned vehicle was a Morris Mini Moke. I can only imagine what reaction a field officer today would have if expected to use one. However it turned out to be an ideal vehicle. Low to the ground, no door, one could hold the steering wheel with one hand and a spotlight in the other, or lean out and scoop some interesting creature up from the road, which is exactly what I did. Rainy nights saw me traversing this lonely road catching frogs. Daytime one might see snakes like death adders, warming up in the morning sun. One night I caught a mouse-like creature, which subsequently went to Basil Marlowe at the Australian Museum. He was mammal curator there, and the first thing he did was pop the poor mouse into a jar of chloroform. That mouse created quite a stir in biology circles. The New Holland mouse is a species first described by George Waterhouse in 1843. 
it vanished from view for over a century, before its rediscovery in Kooringai Chase National Park, north of Sydney in 1967. Subsequently, a flurry of surveys by biologists, found a number of small populations, scattered along the east coast. None were found in the Shoalhaven, though there appears to be no reason why not, since suitable habitats are available. Unlikely though it might be, the New Holland mouse may occur here. Likely locations could be Tiljara and Beecroft Peninsula. It belongs to an ancient family, distinct from other mice. Another rare animal is the potteroo. The long-nosed potteroo is found on the southeastern coast of Australia, from Queensland to eastern Victoria and Tasmania, including some of the base Strait Islands. There are geographically isolated populations in western Victoria. In NSW it is generally restricted to coastal heaths and forests, east of the Great Dividing Range. Potteroos inhabit coastal heaths and dry and wet sclerophyll forests. Dense understory with occasional open areas is an essential part of habitat and may consist of grass trees, sedges, ferns or heath, or of low shrubs, or melaleucas. A sandy loam soil is also a common feature. Conveniently sized for a feral cat or fox meal, they are dependent on us for survival. One man was so concerned about the survival of potteroos that he set up a private sanctuary for them near Knights Hill. The fenced area is electrified at the top to dissuade potential climbing predators. A study of the population there was carried out in 2010. Another population at Red Rocks Nature Reserve was identified in 1996. Potteroos often dig small holes in the ground in a similar way to bandicoots. Bandicoots mainly forage at night, consuming insects, earthworms, insect larvae and spiders. But they also feed on plant tubers, roots and truffle-like fungi to supplement their diet. This means they may compete with potteroos to some extent. Bandicoot foraging performs an important role in keeping bushland ecosystems healthy. A glimpse in the evening half-light means they might be mistaken for potteroos, but their gait is different and they don't stand upright like a potteroo. Bandicoots have coarse hair and are more grey in colour. Long-nosed bandicoots are still common in the Shoalhaven, particularly along the coast. They are often heavily infested with ticks. When I was a kid, we always had bandicoots digging up the lawns. My dad was typical of his generation. If birds raid your orchard or garden destroy them, if bandicoots leave little holes in your lawn shoot them. That is how I came to know about ticks. The inside of a bandicoot's skin looks like a measles infection, there are so many wounds from tick bites. Ticks are common enough on birds, mammals and even reptiles. Bandicoot holes should not be confused with anteater holes, which are generally larger, with much more general disturbance. Anteaters are very powerful and will push aside small logs and rocks to forage for prey. When I was a boy I took an anteater home and put it in my aviary. By next morning it had escaped. It had simply torn the bird wire apart. It was still fastened all around to the timber framework. Fortunately we lived on the edge of bushland, so the animal would have found a new home with plenty of food. Very much rarer than the long nose is the southern brown bandicoot. It has a patchy distribution. It is found in southeastern NSW, east of the Great Dividing Range, south from the Hawkesbury River. It occurs in southeastern South Australia, southwest Western Australia, and the northern tip of Queensland. A fleeting glimpse of these animals may not be sufficient to confidently identify them, particularly in half-light. Their teeth of course are very distinctive, though you are unlikely to get the opportunity to examine them, except perhaps in the case of a roadkill, which is not a very nice way to become aware of the existence of these fascinating animals. There are similarities in the bandicoot dentition to that of marsupial mice, no doubt due to some similarities in diet. Potteroo teeth are similar to those of wallabies in the lower jaw, but wallabies do not have the canines in the upper jaw, and the front top incisors teeth are much smaller and an even row. 
In the foregoing we have discussed species rarely seen, and in many cases in serious decline. I have concentrated on the less charismatic, and for some people, species that they might dismiss as at best, unimportant, perhaps even in some cases surplus to requirements. But such perceptions are gravely misguided. We have learned that predators are necessary, in a healthy ecosystem. Our top marsupial predator, is the tiger quoll. We had already all but lost the smaller daintier quoll on the mainland. Now the tiger quoll is at risk. The spotted-tailed quoll, is listed as a vulnerable species in NSW. Its distribution and population, have dramatically declined, and the animal is now found over a restricted range. In many cases, quolls are living in isolated areas, that may be too small to support viable long-term populations. Reduction in distribution and population has been caused by loss, fragmentation and degradation of suitable quoll habitat, through land clearing, change in fire patterns, and loss of potential den sites such as large hollow logs. Foxes and cats which prey on quolls, also compete with them for food. Feral cats may also spread diseases which affect quolls. They may also face persecution by humans, who have often blamed quolls for the loss of stock and pearl tree. Protection of pearl tree, was one of the main drivers for extermination, when both quoll species were common. The smaller daintier eastern quolls, still occur in Tasmania, and attempts, have been made to reintroduce them to Australia. No verified sightings of live animals occurred in NSW since 1963, though credible reports had been made repeatedly, across much of the former range. A roadkilled individual collected on Barrington Tops in 1989, was recently identified genetically as coming from mainland, rather than a Tasmanian provenance. Wild dog baiting programs, may result in spotted-tailed quolls being accidentally poisoned, though baiting is mostly carried out now, in a way that is designed to minimize risk. Spotted-tailed quolls live in various environments including forests, woodlands, coastal heathlands, and rainforests. They are sometimes seen in open country, or on grazed areas and rocky outcrops. They are mainly solitary animals, and will make their dens in rock shelters, small caves, hollow logs and tree hollows. These animals are highly mobile. They can move up to several kilometers in a night, and may have quite large territories. Within their territories, they will have latrine sites where they defecate, a behavior pattern mirrored by some other animals like wombats. These are often in exposed areas, such as on rocky outcrops. Infrared camera surveys have revealed that quolls are still present in the Barren Grounds Nature Reserve and Budaroo National Park. Though 133 sightings are recorded for Shoalhaven on the Australian Atlas, none are recent. Because quolls have huge home ranges, from 300 to 3,000 hectares, we know they will be moving from these reserves onto the private land. Quolls favor the trees but moderately, as 11% of their traveling is done above ground. Prey items eaten by quolls include insects, crayfish, lizards, snakes, birds, domestic poultry, small mammals, platypus, rabbits, pavelins, small wallabies, and wombats. They may scavenge from larger prey such as kangaroos, feral pigs, cattle, and dingoes. However, the tiger quoll does not scavenge as much as the Tasmanian devil. Much of the prey eaten by the quoll are tree living. They can climb high into trees and make nocturnal hunts for possums and birds. Two subspecies of quolls are recognized. One found from southern Queensland south to Tasmania, and another found in an isolated population in northeastern Queensland, where it is classified as endangered by the Department of Environment and Heritage. Regrettably, so many of our native mammals are nocturnal, and it is not so easy to be enthusiastic about things we so seldom see. Even very common species like possums, which more often only come to notice when they raid the garden, or invade our house roof, tend to be low in the fan club stakes. But some of us are tolerant of these inconveniences, and are even enthusiastic about attractive creatures, 
that sensibly avoid humans where possible, and are only driven to interact with us, when food becomes scarce and habitat is in short supply. In particular we can get a great deal of enjoyment and appreciation from possums, that not only scamper about like squirrels but also fly, or at least glide. In the Shoalhaven there are several glider possums recorded. They include the greater glider, the yellow-bellied glider, the sugar glider, and feather tail. None are especially common, indeed they are disappearing. Most are threatened, vulnerable or endangered. The greater glider is one of particular concern. Probably the most recent sighting, was the unfortunate removal of a home tree near Seven Mile Beach, by Shoalhaven City Council during road works. The tree had several gliders in residence. Seven Mile Beach National Park has long been an important location, despite the periodic major fires that occur there. Gliders rely on tree hollows, which are only found in large mature tree. Seven Mile Beach has many very large black butts, but of course not all of them have suitable tree hollows. The greater glider is the largest gliding possum, with a head and body length of 350 to 450 mm, and a long furry tail measuring 450 to 600 mm. The greater glider has thick fur that increases its apparent size. Fur color is white or cream below, and varies from dark gray, dusky brown through to light mottled gray, and cream above. It has large ears and strongly reflective eye shine in the beam of a spotlight, making it easy to detect. Greater females are generally larger than the males. The head is short, but with a pointed muzzle, and large ears fringed and backed with long fur. The population of the Greater Glider in the Seven Mile Beach National Park area is eligible to be listed as an endangered population, as in the opinion of the NSW Scientific Committee, it is facing a very high risk of extinction in the near future. The Scientific Committee was established by the Threatened Species Conservation Act of 1995, because of its nighttime activities, a natural predator on the glider is the powerful owl. It hunts by concentrating in pockets within their relatively large home range, until populations of prey are depleted, to a level that causes the owl to shift hunting grounds. Other predators include spotted tail quolls, goners, and carpet pythons. A greater threat to greater gliders though, is habitat destruction and fragmentation, and in particular mature old growth forest which contains densites. The sugar glider has blue-gray to brown-gray fur, with a dark stripe that extends from the middle of the head to the middle of its back. Sugar gliders are about the size of a rat, and their tail is thick, and may have a white tip. Sugar gliders are seasonally adapted omnivores, with a wide variety of foods in their diet, and mainly forage in the lower layers of the forest canopy. Sugar gliders may obtain up to half their daily water intake through drinking rainwater, with the remainder obtained through water held in its food. In summer, they are primarily insectivorous, and in the winter when insects and other arthropods are scarce, they mostly feed on acacia gum, eucalyptus sap, or lerp insect covers which are primarily sugar. Sugar gliders have an enlarged cecum to assist in digestion of complex carbohydrates obtained from gum and sap. To obtain sap and nectar from plants, sugar gliders will strip the bark off trees or open bore holes with their teeth to access stored liquid gum. Little time is spent foraging for insects, as it is an energetically expensive process, and sugar gliders will wait until insects fly into their habitat, or stop to feed on flowers. Sugar gliders consume approximately 11 kilograms of dry food matter per day. This equates to roughly 8 to 9 percent of body weight. They are opportunistic feeders, and can be carnivorous, preying mostly on lizards and small birds. Acacia seeds, bird eggs, pollen, fungi, and native fruits. As mentioned earlier they can also develop a taste for nesting birds, particularly parrots, which they find in tree hollows. Pollen can also make up a large portion of their diet, therefore sugar gliders are likely to be important pollinators of Banksia species. There is often competition for nest hollows, particularly with parrots. 
The Sugar Glider was introduced to Tasmania, and now it not only competes for nest hollows, it has also developed a taste for nestling parrots, particularly the critically endangered swift parrot, and this has alarmed biologists. Investigations by the Australian National University recently discovered that sugar gliders were eating approximately half of the adult female swift parrots that nest in Tasmania every year, as well as their eggs and chicks. The yellow-bellied glider is a large, active, sociable and vocal glider. Adults weigh 450 to 700 grams, have a head and body length of about 30 centimeters, and a large bushy tail, that is about 45 centimeters long. It has grey to brown fur above with a cream to yellow belly, which is paler in young animals. The dark stripe down the back is characteristic of the group. It has a large gliding membrane, that extends from the wrist to the ankle. The yellow-bellied glider is a marsupial about the size of a rabbit. It typically has grey-brown fur on its back and has an off-white to orange or yellow belly. It has large pointed ears. The yellow-bellied glider's diet consists of nectar, honeydew, insects, pollen and a wide spread of tree sap including different eucalyptus sap, corymbia sap, some angophora sap, and lophostomon sap. It shows a strong preference for trees with a smooth bark, possibly relating to the volume of sap flow. It obtains the tree sap by biting a V-shaped wedge or notch into the bark to promote the flow of gum and sap. The yellow-bellied glider is the species most commonly recorded. Skirral gliders which are listed as vulnerable, and feather-tailed gliders which are the least often recorded, are also listed locally. Quite rare now in the Shoalhaven region, koalas were once widespread, but probably sparsely distributed. There are only 184 sightings recorded for the region on the National Atlas, and no recent official records. There are occasional reports though of their distinctive claw marks on trees, or what may have been mating calls heard. Koalas have muscular bodies, very strong forelimbs and soft, texture gripping pads, and sharp long claws on their paws, to help them grip and climb. Both the front and hind paws have five digits each. The front paws have two fingers opposing the other three, giving the koala its distinctive double thumb. This arrangement works very well for gripping small branches in the tree tops. The arms and hands are used to hug the tree trunk when climbing, but most of the upward thrust comes from the hind legs. The hind paws have a clawless opposable big toe to help with gripping, while the second and third toes are fused together to form a double clawed grooming toe. The other two toes have very large claws, which are responsible for the distinctive claw marks on trees, which are often in pairs. Hawkesbury sandstone environments, generally the best place to look for claw marks is on grey gums. A koala weighs anything from 5 to 9 kilograms, the male being the largest. With such a weight being propelled upwards, it is easy to appreciate why the claw marks on trees can be quite deep. In NSW, koalas mainly live on the central and north coasts, with some populations west of the Great Dividing Range, on the south coast, and on the southern tablelands. Most populations live in isolated habitats, and many areas in which koalas are most abundant are subject to intense pressures. Gum leaves are not the easiest things to digest. They are tough and contain oils which can be poisonous. To cope with such an unusual diet, koalas have a long, thin tube like an appendix, branching out from their intestines. This tube grows to a length of 2 meters. It probably helps with digestion. As their food contains little energy, koalas conserve energy by sleeping for most of the day and looking for food in the evening. Koalas do not normally drink water, as they usually get sufficient water by licking the dew from leaves. It's always worth examining tree trunks for signs of wildlife. Shredded bark can mean a ringtail possum nest nearby, but they can be difficult to spot. If a possum or koala climbed this tree, little evidence would betray its passing. This bark has been deliberately shredded. Ringtails prefer to build a bulky nest of shredded bark and leaves in the thick middle level canopy about 6 meters from the ground.
Ringtails are not rare, but unlike brushtails, they don't adapt well to urbanization. But they will inhabit gallery woodlands along watercourses if the area is large enough. Ringtails will occasionally live in houses, but they prefer woodland. The nest, which is called a dray, is found in thick foliage of the middle story, mature leptospermum levigatum, Christmas bush, tangled vines etc. The trunks of the trees may be 100 to 150 mm in diameter. In the old days, catching entailed shaking the tree with cyclonic vigor until the possum fell to the ground and you could pounce on it. Not the easiest process especially at night. It is hardly a technique that would pass the ethics test today. One of the most charming of the local possums though is the pygmy possum. Few people get to see it because it is now so scarce, and it is also tiny, little bigger than a house mouse. Eastern pygmy possums are only 15 to 43 grams, active climbers, with almost bare, prehensile tails, and big, forward-pointing ears. They are grayish or light brown above and white below. Adults have a head and body length between 70 to 110 mm, and a tail length between 75 to 105 mm. They are found in a broad range of habitats, from rainforest through eucalypt forest and woodland to heath, but in most areas woodlands and heath appear to be preferred, except in northeastern NSW, where they are most frequently encountered in rainforest. Pygmy possums feed largely on nectar and pollen collected from banksias, eucalypts and bottle brushes, and are an important pollinator of heathland plants. Soft fruits are eaten when flowers are unavailable. Pygmy possums also feed on insects throughout the year. This feed source may be more important in habitats where flowers are less abundant. Pygmy possums shelter in tree hollows, rotten stumps, holes in the ground, and abandoned bird nests. Nest building appears to be restricted to breeding females. Tree hollows are favored, but spherical nests have been found under the bark of eucalypts and in shredded bark in tree forks. Pygmy numbers fluctuate considerably in response to fires. After big fires there are no flowers, and numbers of pygmy possums crash. Insects are available but they are also collected by marsupial mice, who also find such food under rock slabs and in leaf litter, places less likely to be frequented by pygmy possums. Few people are likely to see one, let alone experience cradling one in the palm of their hand. I consider myself very fortunate to have had that experience. Indeed during my lifetime I have interacted with many species which the current generation will probably never see. I have been so very fortunate. Ever since I was a child L considered the deliberate extermination of the Tasmanian tiger by white settlers a great personal tragedy because I will never see one. It is considered to have become extinct just two years before I was born. In NSW the eastern native cat had disappeared in my recent memory, though I have now seen them in Tasmania. Most boys and girls growing up today are so insulated from the wild and faced with such depleted populations of wild creatures, I am sure that many like me will mourn their passing. I am saddened that those boys and girls will inherit an impoverished Australia since there is not much progress being made to stop the runaway extinction train. At times in the foregoing discussion, I have made reference to what is recorded in the Bionet Atlas. This is an important database of biological information about our environment, the occurrence and distribution of the animals and plants on our continent. It is managed by scientists, primarily located in the New South Wales Department of Environment, but is dependent on university researchers, environmental scientists, private environment surveyors, and many others in local government and the community generally. Conversely it is a vital resource of information for town planning, environmental assessments, and species management by responsible authorities. Regrettably it is far from complete or up-to-date, or even infallible. Almost any adult person can become a contributor to the data, but it does require you to be registered. I am unable to say if there is any way contributors are assessed before they are registered.
Of course environmental scientists do need a higher level of certification for access to the more sensitive workings of the atlas. I am aware that I have seen many species in my lifetime and those observations have never been recorded. Trying to get an understanding of the presence or absence of particular species can be very frustrating when you know that the information is incomplete. When completed, the spreadsheet has to be converted to a CSV file and then lodged with a department. Usually in a fairly short time a response is returned, indicating validation and acceptance of the submission. If errors are detected, the log lists where the errors are and the observer has to make corrections and resubmit. A companion process is the MAPS.6, which is also run by the NSW government. It is also a free resource for anyone to access. In many ways, it is a very simple way of pinpointing your location. If you are not comfortable interpreting aerial photographs or satellite images, particularly near the urban interface, MAPS 6 has a marvelous overlay of base maps, which show urban boundaries and land reserves. I have briefly touched on matters relating to records of wildlife sightings. We have come a long way in the last 60 years. We have moved from the destructive sampling that was the way things were done in the old days. The image here represents the old way of collecting wildlife information. I knew a man who was a preparator for the Australian Museum, whose job it was to go out and shoot things, skin them and take them back as specimens for study or display. He was also president of our Herpetological Society, well regarded and respected for his knowledge of reptiles. Destructive sampling was generally accepted in the name of science. We are very fortunate today that technology has opened up many passive survey options which can dramatically improve things. Any handling of wild creatures inevitably causes stress. Little bats that find their flight suddenly terminated by the undetected wires of a harp trap would no doubt be disconcerted to find themselves falling into the collection pocket below only to be handled by some monster of a human. They would be almost overcome by shock and awe. Before any active capture and release of wild animals is undertaken, we need pretty good justification, so we have set up review committees to oversee the process. Automated sound recorders come in a huge range of configurations. Most are designed for indoor use in meetings, and quality of sound and sensitivity are quite variable. You can get a recorder, that is no bigger than a USB drive or pencil, but obviously useless for environmental monitoring. You need to be able to recognize who is calling. Automatic camera traps are a huge advance forward for passive recording and monitoring in the natural environment. They too come in a variety of designs. Virtually anybody can use them, and they are very unobtrusive, so wildlife behaves naturally. Of course if they are left unattended, they are at risk from theft, so you are pretty cautious about where you leave them. They are essentially for recording species presence, rather than for feature video recording. This looks like a good target for a camera trap. Well chewed around the entrance, and the wound at the side of the hole suggests a sap-eating glider, though it is too small a hole for yellow-bellied gliders. The tree is one of dozens of very old trees, in a small, less than pristine bushland remnant, in the middle of suburbia. Unfortunately it is only yards from a walking track, which is even used sometimes at night, so I couldn't risk my camera. If you are a watcher of wildlife, you really need lots of patience, and of course time.